Mm. Uh, to uh, I'll start this off, I'd just like to get some feedback from uh, your understanding of uh, the general understanding of the word witness. What does it mean, you know, to, to you? What, what, what is your understanding of the term witness generally? And you can also relate it biblically or in, in the spiritual sense too, biblically. You understand? Yep. Yeah. Well, one meaning is to, to see something. Um, to, uh, as far as for purposes of verification, um, uh, like a notary as a witness or something like that. Um, and then in using that same definition, um, spiritually, um, to see how God moves in your life and, and verifying it by giving testimony. So that's what it, so that's how I look at it. Okay, all right. Can you hear? Uh, if you go to God, it's not you. Didn't hear you, Miss Mary. And uh, Miss Paul, spiritually, I agree. So when you see it in the, in the side, it's like you know, you going through something, or you so when you go to the Lord and and ask Him for something. In and uh, if we get it, uh, it's not like right away, you know, his time, and say not in my time, but but uh, a witness to uh, God's goodness. That aspect, you know, of course, healing and just helping us. Um, get to a certain situation in a you know particular way, and it's like, all right, in, in that regard, you know, word of prayer, and you know, it's not in my not in my time, but uh, your goodness, a, a witness to. God's goodness in what is your Bible witness? What what kind of witness are you when it comes to the Bible, the word of God? Do you believe it to be so? What is your Bible witness? I do, I believe it to be so. Okay. I believe that the, the Bible is the word of God. Okay. And 
divine is divine authorship of the word inspired by him to be written by those who were inspired. God breathed. God breathed unadulterated word of our creator. Amen. Things in the Bible, you know, that happen was these are all what's happening. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Oh. Well, I was just going to say that um, in the general sense, a witness is like a onlooker, somebody who sees something happen, but not necessarily have any participation in what is happening. And I think that Spirit, spiritually, it's it's not like that. When you witness something in the spiritual sense, you also have, you know, you also participate in it. Whereas um, you are a witness to what God has done in your life, so you are a participant. You're not just seeing what happens; you are a part of what happens. All right. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Francis. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You still up to reading the scripture? Yeah. Yeah. Let me get my Bible. Okay. All right. Okay, what's the what is it? Luke, the twenty fourth chapter of Luke. And beginning at the thirty sixth verse to the end. Luke twenty four. You said Luke twenty four thirty six. Go to six. Okay. And before Francis began reading, I'm, I'm going to set the context. Huh? I, I say before you begin reading, I want to set the context for what I, I'm going to say. And that oh, is okay. what Francis is reading. She is reading what Jesus has. Uh, been crucified and uh, naturally the disciples uh, were scared and then the women uh, had gone to the tomb and saw that it was empty but in the meantime all that, the disciples were fearful. They didn't kill our leaders. And next gonna be us. So they were hiding out, locking themselves up in rooms. And these, now we're talking about now, the disciples that we're talking about here, these were on the road to a mess, which is, they were it's about seven miles from Jerusalem because with uh, the death of Christ, it wasn't, it wasn't a good place to, 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 to be in because they were afraid. And so they had left Jerusalem for their own, seeking their own safety by going to Emmaus. And mm -hmm. it's, of course, with what happened to them in Emmaus, 
it, they ended up and turned around and went back to Jerusalem. Okay, friends. Okay, Luke, Luke 24, 30, began at 36 verse. And as they, and, and as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it, it, it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into, into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Paul also mentioned, no, no Jesus' body wasn't just a vision or a ghost. The disciples touched him and he ate food. On the other hand, his body wasn't just a restored human body like Lazarus. He was able to appear and disappear. Jesus' resurrected body was even more real than before. It was immortal. This is the kind of body we will be given at the resurrection of the dead. We can assume that many days elapsed between verses 43 and 44 because Jesus and his followers traveled to Galilee and bite before he returned to heaven. In the second book, Acts, Luke makes it clear that Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples between his resurrection and ascension. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms is a way to describe the entire Old Testament. In other words, the entire Old Testament points to the Messiah. For example, his role as a prophet was foretold in Deuteronomy. His sufferings were prophesied in Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53. His resurrection was predicted in Psalms 16, 9 through 11 and Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. Jesus opened these people's mind to understand the scriptures. The Holy Spirit does this in our life today when we study the Bible. Have you ever wondered how to understand a difficult Bible passage? Besides reading sounding passages, asking other people and consulting reference works, pray that the Holy Spirit will open your mind to understand, giving you the need, needed insight to put God's word into action in your life. Luke wrote to the Greek speaking world. He wanted them to know that Christ's message of God's love and forgiveness should go to all the world. We must never ignore the worldwide scope of Christ's gospel. God, 
God wants all the world to hear the good news of salvation. As the disciples stood and watched, Jesus began rising into the air and soon he disappeared into heaven. Seeing Jesus leave must have been frightening, but they knew he would keep his promise to be with them in the spirit. The same Jesus who lived with the disciples, who died and was buried, and who rose from the dead, loves us and promises to be with us always. We can get to know him better through studying the scriptures, praying, and allowing the Holy Spirit to make us more like him. God's word for God's people. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to just hear again from you. that passage, what are your thoughts regarding that, the passage of the word of God as, as it has been read to us about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Just some thoughts on it. Well, uh, I had a professor, Dr. Briggs, and I, I'll tell you when I got to the seminary, it, well, I was called. I was not a Bible reader. I read the Bible in preparation for Sunday school, uh, but I mean, no, not preparation. I read the Bible in Sunday school. <laughs> Uh, I mean, growing up and um, the end, even in my adult life, I was not a Bible reader or an, an, an avid one. Dr. Briggs, in the who was my New Testament professor, he started out with the story of the Bible because it was important to know the story of the Bible to understand, to apply in our daily living, the stories in the Bible. And so I, I this, this, it transformed my life as I, at that point, I mean, learning the story of the Bible. did a great deal to my life. And I, I just pray too, that with all that you already know, that something will be said that can put it all in perspective. And I, I, this won't just be the first one, I will be doing it simply because uh, I, I know this is of God it's at this time and at this place and where you are in your lives spiritually, God wants you to hear this. And I came up with, with myself because the challenge to me and as I've look at what's going on in the world and especially as I've grown and matured and looking at the church and the shepherds 
of the churches as well as the sheep. Using the churches, I just use strictly for a, a, a subject of this God cast and I will and, uh, from deserter back to disciple because those guys now Jesus had a lot of disciples and now this road to Emmaus these were not of the 11 disciples these were, were many others in fact he had a lot of women disciples too so here these guys running away from Jerusalem this, they had deserted that whole city because of what happened to Jesus there. And they had deserted their discipleship. And the many temptations, and as I was challenged in my own spiritual life, I thank God that it was the understanding, the impact of knowing the history of the Bible, which in those difficult and trying times made me a disciple, even though tempted to desert it. And I say in that experience that I had with the church, I was ready to deserted and go back to teaching school. But be that as it may, these disciples were on their road, they had deserted Jerusalem and, and was joined by this person with them and the disciples said to him, uh, you don't know what's going on. You 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 haven't heard anything because you know that they God deliberately made it unable for them to recognize who had joined them. He had deliberately blinded them, not in the physical sense, but spiritually blinded them. They didn't know who was walking along with them as they had deserted Jerusalem and was going to Emmaus to relocate. And they said to him, you, 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 you don't know about all that has happened. And so uh, and then he, he said uh, uh, they, they were telling him about all that had happened and how Jesus had uh, been crucified and uh, and so he listened and listened to them. And they knew their history because they were a witness to what had taken place. And uh, he began to share with them. And you look at verse 19 and he said, what things he asked them? So they, had, so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, now these are the men, the, the, uh, the disciples who have deserted him. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. 
They arrived early at the tomb, and when they did find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. Well, and you know, the first one that called himself going to run to the tomb was, was, was Peter, but John knew a shortcut. So John beat Peter there. So he said to them in verse 25, how unwise and slow you are to believe. This is Jesus talking now, to believe in your hearts all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now the scriptures there was Moses, you know, the law of Moses, the prophets and the book of Psalms, or, 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 or and it expanded to the to the writings. So that would include uh, Proverbs and uh, Psalm of Psalms. But though that was that was the scriptures, not the Bible. Those were the scriptures to the Hebrew. God's witness nation. Verse 28, they came to the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. So they said to each other, weren't our hearts ablaze within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. Just that quick, they turned from being a deserters and going back to Jerusalem to be disciples. And so they found the 11 and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has certainly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, right here, I'm going to just think about the, you know, the story of the little boy who went to the church, went to Sunday school for the first time, and they told him about uh, uh, the waters parting and then they talked about Jesus walking on the water and all those things. So he came back. They asked him what his parents asked him, uh, what did he learn in Sunday school? And he came up with a whole lot of modern day stuff. Uh, how how uh, Moses and, and used them tanks and, <laughs> and everything uh, to defeat the Egyptians. And so his parents, knowing better, they say, well, well uh, are you sure? Is this the truth you're telling them? He told them, no, nah, but if what they told me is the truth, you ain't going to believe that either. And the point is, it's in you being an honest to goodness disciple that you understand those who were a witness to what we just read and how do we know they were a witness to it? Because it's reported here in Luke, Luke or Gentile and he, yet he, Uh, has the uh, 
the, his book, both Luke and Acts, are the uh, uh, are the largest in the New Testament, like the 160 Psalm is, uh, 150, the uh, 119th Psalm is in the New in the Old Testament. And so, but he is a Gentile, the only Gentile writer in the Bible, and he wrote the most. He was a doctor, he was a physician. And the important thing is he was among these, these uh, the disciples, but not only that, he, for two years, he was around them and he saw their lives move from fear to fearlessness. And so now here is that setting, Jesus been crucified, But on the third day, he, he, third day, he was raised from the dead and appeared to the disciples and the others and ate a lie by him being a spirit. The spirit didn't eat no fish sandwich. Because I ain't no justification for us to sell fish sandwiches in the church, which he did for years. But the thing is, he showed to them uh, when when we you go to verse thirty six, verse thirty seven. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. And Jesus said to him, why are you troubled? He asked him, and why no, why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. My feet. It is I, it, it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they still were amazed and unbelieving because of their joy, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was here with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalm, and that's the, that, would, that would be the Jewish scriptures, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them that it is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sin would be proclaimed to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And that's Luke's great commission. But the point is, <clears throat> this is a report that Luke was a witness to the very disciples who was a witness to the very things that took place that Luke is writing about in this report. In other words, Luke didn't see it, but he was a witness to those who did see it. And that's why when you go to the uh, the first chapter of Luke, in the very first verse, he says, 
many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. It also seemed good to them, to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Luke was writing to Theophilus, and we say, well, we know, look at the name. He, Luke is writing to the Greek, and we look at the, with the, the name, it is Greek, and he must have been a lover of God, and he wanted to know, and, and, and people were doing a whole lot of talking, a whole lot of lying. Uh, and uh, Luke, he, 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 being Greek and writing to, to Greek, Luke said to him, and we believe Luke to be the first systematic theologian, because he systematized the information that was available to him and the accounts of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, what the gospels were saying, and, and keep this in mind, the gospel about what, the, when, what is the gospel? The good news, they call it the good news from the battlefield. <laughs> what that means that the war against sin is over, it's been won. And it was won at the cross. When Jesus was crucified and his blood shed, is the gospel of God to us, to let us know he ain't mad with us no more. He want us, he's been reconciled to us, and we are forgiven purely because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection seals the deal. The grave couldn't hold him. He is the son of God. So he died. To save us. And he arose to give us the salvation of eternal life. And Luke, in, in all the gospels, this stuff was talked about. This dead man was alive and was seen by others. And the gospels talk about the man Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection. <clears throat> now they didn't do no book tour. They did not sit down to write <laughs> no book. They were writing the truth, writing what they were a witness to from what they learned from those who saw Jesus in his resurrected glory. And what they wrote
they talked about first and was telling it first. Because it had been promised it's in God's with this nation, the Jews, that a Messiah would come and would save his people from their sin. That you, you, nobody can keep the law of Moses. But Jesus did. And that was the requirement. And so because of what Jesus did, Fulfill the scriptures that the Jews had, had forgotten. Of course, we still had that remnant. They began to write it down so that it wouldn't be forgotten. They wanted the people to know who Jesus is. So as a witness, They passed on this information. And of course, a lot of people didn't believe it, but they weren't concerned about uh, writing no book. They were not concerned about making money from it. They were concerned about telling to others the gospel of God as contained in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news from the battlefield, the war is over. God has forgiven us purely because of the blood of Jesus. And he's alive. He we saw him a sin. He came as a baby, but he's going to come back as this resurrected Savior. He's alive. We touched where the nails pierced him. We saw his side. We, we, we touched those things. And even though they were under threat, to teach this and were told that they would be killed if they continued to do it, and they all, as a result of their witness, the 12 was killed because mm -hmm. of them teaching about Jesus Christ. This is the crucible out of which the book that we call the Bible was born. But they were not writing it. The gospel accounts were not written with the purpose of having a Bible in mind. It was written by men who witnessed the resurrected Savior and Luke hung around with them for two years after it was all over. And he wrote as a witness to what he had heard and seen and read from Matthew, Mark, and John, okay. But the only one that has an extension to, well, the only one to write an extension to the gospel was Luke. And the difference being that Luke wrote with a truth that was favorable to women. 
he talked about how Jesus was concerned about women. Uh, Luke, writing at the close of the gospel to Theophilus, And I, I know you, you're going to hear a lot of things. You've probably heard a lot of things. But here is the truth. As I witness it. And so we have at the end of the gospel of Luke, who, who concludes all the gospels, we have the Acts. Again, wrote, written by Luke, and the first part, and Luke 1, 1 is the same as Luke Acts 1, 1. He said, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So the this, the disciples who didn't, uh, who who, the, the, who uh, did not desert, who became the, uh, the disciples are now apostles because they got a message. Uh, apostles are the carriers of the message of the cross, the the gospel. And after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And of course, we know what's included in that is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so verse 8 in Acts 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then they give the, the account of the ascension. So here, I just want to conclude with this. Where the acts, I mean, where the gospel ends, this is key. The acts begin. Where the witnesses, witness being a witness to what the gospel writers were a witness to, then your witness. has everything to do with the way you act. So the end of the gospels is the beginning of your acts. And that means that the gospel is not the end, it's the beginning. And it's, it's the beginning because it leads to act. So if you were a witness, then you need to act. And the action must produce, it does it come from change inside of you internally, so you to effectuate change externally. But you got to act on your witness. All that you feel when it comes to the word of God, uh, in, in your relationship with the word of God, your witness to it is seen in how you act with others. And the change starts with you. 
there has to be a change in you. Mm-hmm. See, mm-hmm. The, the, it has to start with the act. It, it can't uh, 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 exist. The, the, the acts cannot exist without the gospel and the gospel cannot exist without the act. So the act of love is to be about the witnesses of those who love Jesus as a result of the fact that he is alive. The acts of mercy, your, your, the act of grace that it, you, the, your grace to somebody else, your mercy to somebody else must flow out of your witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ who is alive and is going to come back. the main gospel of resurrection. is supposed to produce some acts of resurrection. So when life gets you down or when Satan got things uh, he, uh, when God permits Satan to do certain things, that Satan wants to destroy us because of our witness to the Jesus that he tried to destroy in death. We understand that what Satan tries to destroy, God is using it to develop. And in so doing, it produces certain acts in your life. So you witness to the gospel should produce the acts of God, of Jesus Christ. The acts of God that comes from your knowledge of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so it it is that it wasn't until the time of Constantine that this information that Luke had reported, the gospel and and from all the acts, Constantine said, this stuff is so special. And he was an emperor. He says, I want it written and put all together. And because the emperor was a witness to what he had heard from others when it come to Jesus Christ, he had them, he had it all put together in what he called the book. And the book was about the resurrection of Jesus Christ that he called the Biblica or the Bible. And what he falsely was that 
your relationship with God is dependent upon your relationship to his word that you are a witness to those who heard it and experienced it in the person of Jesus Christ. So, it was later decided to add the Jewish writings of Moses, Psalms, and the writings of the prophets to add that to and make it known, to add it to the Bible. But the Bible is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there were no resurrection, there wouldn't be no Bible. And it's the account of those who witnessed a man crucified that came back to life. And he talked about it before it was done. And he, it was not a ghost or a phantom or a spirit because he ate fish. So if you can believe, even though you weren't there to witness all of this, as you are being sanctified, you can imagine all of what I have been talking about, but you can imagine it also and even read it from the word of God. <clears throat> so that when you're going through difficult times, you don't have to worry if you are a witness. If you have been a witness, you ain't got no need to worry. And, 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 and I'm saying you didn't have to be back there to be a witness. You got the Holy Spirit who is there to comfort, to help, to guide you. So that uh, uh, what uh, comes to mind, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's every day. I will feel no evil because you're with me. Your rod and your staff comforts me. You fix a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with all my cup runs over. God didn't promise us now that we wouldn't have some things to deal with. He didn't promise us that it wouldn't happen. He didn't promise us that we wouldn't have enemies. He, wouldn't prom he didn't promise us that there would be things that will tempt us to be afraid or, or, or the presence of evil. But he just said, in despite of all that's going on in your life, you wake up every morning with pain and you find yourself moving slowly and you can't do like you used to do. Your cup is still overflowing with blessings because you didn't just wake up, you were able to get up. Amen. Amen. Next time, you get, and I, that's why I just enjoy a hot cup of coffee in the morning. Amen. See, because I don't get no half a cup, I get a full cup. Because you know, God ain't about just enough, He's about surplus. He makes your cup overflow. 
he will provide not your wants. He will give some of your wants, but he provides your needs. And you will always have your needs. And if you want to be for real, you got some of your needs that run over that you can share in another person's need. <laughs> and finally, in spite of all your hurt and your pain and what you find yourself going through, be a witness to the fact that that stuff can't stop you. that you, your cup, still runs over. And I'm going to trust God when it comes to all that there is that I face because I know of those in the past who trusted him and I believe him. And because I believe him, ain't no need for me to worry about nothing. Uh, all you need to know is that the Bible is the work of God, and it was not written to be a bestseller. It was not written because the writers, the gospel writers were ambitious and wanted to get themselves known all over the world. No, it was written. to carry on what they were a witness to. And me and you didn't have to be back there to be a witness to what they witnessed because it was something that what Kim was saying spiritually, we're all a witness. And finally, The Bible, this isn't all of the story, but <clears throat> I use Luke because as at <clears throat> the conclusion of the gospel is the beginning of the act. At the conclusion of an understanding of some of the story of the Bible, what it was about, what we are reading, and if we're reading it as we are, then we come to know, like Dr. Briggs used to say, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. revealed. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the story of the Bible, believe in its witness to the point you are a witness to what they were a witness to spiritually and your sanctification takes on an imagination that places you back there, then you can see how God has overflowed you and all the things you find yourself going through. Look at <clears throat> in the light 
of a resurrected Savior, what God has done to let you know he is real. He can make you read about how real he is. But the Holy Spirit and what you experience lets you know he's real. And look at your life, and I, I, I conclude the fact that long before we use the term email, God blessed me with two emails, M-A-L-E-S. One was named Enoch, and the other was named Eddie. Both of their names start with E. From Enoch, I learned and was a witness to stability <laughs> and principle and standing when everybody around you leaves you. With Eddie, that's Cookie's daddy, I learned about not being ostentatious, staying grounded, and being humble. And Amen. those two emails to me, I can be a witness to. They are dead and gone. But you look at your mama, you look at your friend, God has surrounded you with a witness who has shared with you their witness to the kind of God here. And if and they it was shared with them, their witness of those experience. And it goes on and on and on. And you got the power. It's right before you, and you need to let your cup overflow and stop worrying and being fearful because you don't want God to stop pouring. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen Rev. Amen. Rev, Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. I, 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 I first learned of that word ostentatious from John Hopkins. <laughs> All right. And I had I had to hurry up and go to the dictionary to look it up. <laughs> being more well, than what you want, being more than what you all are. <laughs> yeah, that's that cookie. He was his he, he now he had a brother <laughs> who was flamboyant. <laughs> Uncle B, but he was <laughs> great sermon, real. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.